almost every network these days connects to the internet, which means that we have a whole new set of problems that we have to address in a network design. How do we securely connect to the internet, and what are some of the guidelines that we should follow? When we connect to the internet, we have to think that there's a whole new myriad of threats and attacks that we now have to worry about if we were not connected. Not to discount the threats and attacks that actually come from inside of the campus network, as there's still quite a few of those. But now we have to worry about the entire world as we connect to the internet. Specifically, if we're going to be using the internet as a connection between branch offices with a VPN, we've got to make sure that we understand how those internet connections should work. What are our firewall strategies? Exactly how are we going to facilitate some of the active directory service level components through our firewalls? So let's take a look at some of our internet connection strategies. The first thing that we need to do when designing for internet connectivity is to identify strategies for firewall design. Identifying different mechanisms that we can help to protect our network with firewalls is an excellent idea. We also need to identify what our forest options are for a firewall environment to make sure that we understand how our replication is going to function through firewalls. We also need to identify whether or not an extranet is going to be part of the equation. If we do have partners or vendors that need to connect to us across the internet, we need to make sure that we're able to extend the guidelines of our security policy over across the unsecure medium. And also following some of the general guidelines for internet connectivity is something that will help us to summarize the overall design. The first thing that we have to deal with are the strategies for firewall design. Now in many situations we're focused on smaller companies that are connecting to the internet and will rely heavily upon an internet service provider to facilitate much of their service level information which is necessary to run their business such as their external DNS or possibly even their external web services. But nonetheless, no matter how small or large the organization is, you can never exist without a firewall. Although a firewall is not the last component that you should be worried about when it comes to security, it's definitely one of the first. What I'm saying by that is, is that just because you have a firewall does not mean that you should feel secure. Firewalls are designed to make it more difficult for attacks to come in from the Internet. They do not make it impossible. Security is designed to keep people honest. So really what we're focused on is understanding how our firewalls can be used to help us protect better than no firewall at all. When we look at strategies for firewall design, there's really three primary strategies that we will use to connect our intranet to the internet. Now the intranet is the network which we own, the network which we of course enforce our security policy on, and the network that involves all of the services that we use in our environment. When we connect that intranet to the internet component, we need to make sure that a firewall design is decided upon so that we can help to protect the intranet environment. One of the first methods that we have is simply using a bastion host sitting behind a single firewall. A single firewall with two interfaces, which directly connects to our internet service provider, is one way that we can do this. Having a public resource, such as a web server, can be sitting on the same network as our local area network. This firewall can be a hardware-based firewall appliance, or even quite potentially a hardware router which is using ACL packet filtering. Either way, we want to make sure that we have some measure of security between ourselves and the Internet Service Provider. One of the more common options is to use a three-interface firewall. A three-interface firewall actually creates an external or outside connection to the ISP, an inside connection to the local area network, and finally, what is known as a DMZ, or protected DMZ, a demilitarized zone, where public resources can be stored. Because the public resources are actually stored behind the firewall, one of the advantages that you have with the three-interface firewall is that NAT, or network address translation, is even used for the public resources themselves. And what that means is that even though a public address, or globally routable IP address, is referenced for the public resource, it still must pass through the rules of the firewall for access to the system. And that means that only certain ports have to be open to certain destinations to help to make the environment more secure. This also takes the pressure off of the firewall to open the network connection to the local area network from the Internet. Now granted, the firewall will still have to allow outbound access and return trip traffic back through based upon outbound requests. But any individual who's connecting in from the Internet to get to a public resource, such as a web server, never has to touch the intranet. And that really does help to implement a much greater level of security in your network environment. We also have what is known as the back-to-back -back firewall configuration. Now this can be somewhat misleading sometimes because we actually have multiple options with a back-to-back -back firewall. 
In the case of some of the hardware-based appliances that are used as the inside firewall, such as the PIX or checkpoint firewall as an example, these devices will actually only have local area network connectivity on either side, such as fast Ethernet or gigabit Ethernet. And therefore, if we connect to our Internet service provider using a WAN connection like a T1 or T3, this firewall would not be able to facilitate that connection anyway. So a lot of times, a router is used as a secondary firewall to do two things. To provide a media translation between local area network technologies like Ethernet and the WAN connection, such as the T3 or T1, and also to provide some sort of a packet filtering firewall mechanism. What we end up with with a back-to-back -back firewall design is quite potentially two different types of DMZs. With a back-to-back -back firewall, there's always a DMZ between the firewalls, which is known as the mid-ground DMZ, or mid-ground screen subnet. It's known as being screened because it's only screened typically behind some sort of a packet filter on the external or perimeter router. Now, we do have the option of placing our public resources on the screen DMZ and then keeping our local area network, our intranet, behind the second firewall. Or we even have the option on the internal firewall of using a three-interface system. And doing this, we can actually move the public resources to a third interface on the firewall to protect them even more. Since there is such a pressure for companies to be able to implement the best security possible when it comes to even protecting public resources, we do need to consider all of these options in our design. I would recommend that you look into a variety of design options for perimeter networks and try to decide which way you want to go. I would also recommend that you always look into hardware-based devices for security. One of the things about hardware-based appliances for security with perimeter networks is that they are typically built upon very obscure operating systems that are not based upon a Windows underlying operating system or a Unix underlying operating system. The problem with software-based firewalls is that if there are any vulnerabilities in the core operating system underneath it, then all of a sudden that firewall is also vulnerable. So hardware appliances are typically the best way to go if you really need security.